Hi, I'm Rosie, and this is Mouse, and today we'll be exploring some of the fascinating and far-fetched literary interpretations of the disease formerly known as consumption, and in particular, the romantic consumptive death. So this means that throughout this video I'm mostly going to be examining consumption in the Romantic period, but there's lots of crossover between earlier literary interpretations of the disease in the early to mid 18th century and later ones in the Victorian period. But for now, please sit back, relax, and get ready for some gore. Before we dive in, it's worth clarifying a couple of things. Firstly, and very briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Romantic period, this is Romantic with a capital R, and it means something different from the common use of the word Romantic today, which is often used to describe feelings of love. To refer to the Romantic period, or Romanticism, signifies a particular literary, intellectual, artistic and cultural movement prominent in Europe during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Consumption has been famously described as the Romantic disease, and this has to do with the perceived sensitivity of Romantic period writers and artists, and the way it was believed the disease took hold. But more on that later. One good starting place for learning more about Romanticism in general is in this book, which also doubles as a weapon, and you can learn more about one of the key Romantic writers, John Keats, in my video, link in the description. Secondly, I want to clarify that when I'm talking about consumption in this video, I mean the disease we would now call pulmonary tuberculosis. In the early 19th century, the word consumption, while often used to refer to diseases that bore the symptoms of tuberculosis, was also used as a catch-all term for diseases that caused bodily wasting, diseases that seemed to consume the body. So for the sake of clarity, when I'm talking about consumption here, I'm actually talking specifically about the joys of pulmonary TB. Consumption is an infectious disease that most commonly affects the lungs, and is spread through the air when a person coughs or speaks. Good job we don't have to worry about that kind of thing today. Imogen Clark, then Assistant Curator of Medicine at the Science Museum in London, tells us the earliest evidence of tuberculosis can be found in human remains over 9,000 years old. And according to Tuberculosis, Pathogenesis, Protection and Control, tuberculosis probably occurred as a sporadic and unimportant disease of humans in their early history. It wasn't until the 1700s and early 1800s, the tail end of which was the Romantic period, that the prevalence of the disease peaked in Western Europe and North America, which led to consumption being undoubtedly the largest cause of death in the period. The disease course was generally slow, often progressing for months if not years, and in that time sufferers were met with a range of symptoms that a quick search on the NHS website will tell you include lack of appetite and weight loss, a high temperature, night sweats, extreme tiredness or fatigue, worsening breathlessness, and the symptom we're perhaps most familiar with, the coughing up of blood-filled mucus. These symptoms would typically worsen over time, resulting in a painful and protracted death. Now, people do still die from consumption today. The WHO states that a total of 1.5 million people died from TB in 2020 alone, but they also make it clear that nowadays the disease is curable and preventable. Dying from consumption during the Romantic period was seldom preventable, and there was no effective cure. People didn't really understand what caused the disease. According to the Contagion section of Harvard Library's Curiosity Collections, for most of the 19th century, tuberculosis was thought to be a hereditary, constitutional disease rather than a contagious one. Later on in the century, you might attempt to treat your consumption at a sanatorium, but it wasn't until the early 20th century that effective antibiotic treatments for the disease were developed and dispensed. Consumption way back in the early 1800s was a horrific and all too common way to go. But surprisingly, this gruesome reality didn't always match up with the public perception of the disease. What's fascinating about consumption is the way it was shaped in the popular imagination as a desirable, nay ideal, way to die. Professor Clark Lawler of Northumbria University begins his book, Consumption and Literature, The Making of the Romantic Disease, with a quote from Edgar Allan Poe's 1832 short story, Metzengerstein, in which the narrator covets a consumptive death. The beautiful Lady Mary, how could she die? And of consumption? But it is a path I have prayed to follow. I would wish all I love to perish of that gentle disease. How glorious! to depart in the heyday of young blood, the heart all passion, the imagination all fire, amid the remembrances of happier days, in the fall of the year, and so be buried up forever in the gorgeous autumnal leaves." Gentle? Glorious? Gorgeous autumnal leaves? Not the descriptors that spring to mind, you might say, when it comes to this ghastly disease with its drawn-out period of suffering and host of cruel symptoms. 
But Poe's description isn't just a bizarre anomaly. It's part of a literary tradition that glamorises and fetishises consumption, a tradition that is bound up with and informed by a series of very odd and perhaps unexpected myths surrounding the disease. To understand the great disparity between the reality of consumption and its idealisation in the public imagination, we need to explore some of these myths in more detail. Myth number one. Consumption was indicative of emotional sensitivity and male creative genius. As Dr Mitchell L. Hammond of the University of Victoria writes in Epidemics and the Modern World, consumptive patients were often singled out as being highly sensitive and intellectually precocious. They were mentally fragile and prone to overexertions of the mind, and it was this restless mental activity that left them somehow exposed, vulnerable, heightening their susceptibility to disease. Lawler describes the popularisation of a romantic vitalism in medicine that suggested intense and sorrowful passions of the sensitive individual were likely to cause consumption. It was believed that this was the case with romantic poet John Keats. Percy Bysshe Shelley, another romantic poet, wrote to Keats in July 1820, little over a year before Keats' death. This consumption is a disease particularly fond of people who write such good verses as you have done. We might infer from this that Keats's heightened sensitivity and intellectual ability means he is a good poet, but these qualities also leave him vulnerable to consumption. Shelley's comment implicitly identifies Keats as the stereotypical young man overcome by unruly emotions who writes feverishly until he burns out, leaving himself susceptible to the disease. In his letters, Keats himself describes feeling scarcely content to write the best verses for the fever they leave behind. He also describes writing as a feverous relief, and relates how his doctor believed his consumption to be a direct result of too great an excitement of poetry. But what about women? It seems that this pervasive connection between intelligence, creativity, sensitivity and consumption was almost always used to describe men. Women, on the other hand, were often portrayed as fair maidens who expired in full bloom while their male counterparts burned brightly and exhausted their vital energy in heroic early death. Where the men are actively creating, the brilliance of which is routinely qualified by the disease and their artistic process emboldened by it, women are perceived as languishing on daybeds, becoming more and more lovely. For women, it's not so much their talent that's qualified by consumption, but their physical beauty. Consumption, then, could function as a kind of status symbol. As Lawler writes, it took away the cleverest and most beautiful people of the better sort, especially the young. Intelligence, sensitivity, beauty, youth, we can begin to understand why the disease was so readily considered ideal. And speaking of physical beauty, that brings us to our next myth. Myth number two. Consumption was super sexy. Oddly enough, this most heinous of diseases was often considered a lover's disease that carried with it a certain allure. Lord Byron reportedly exclaimed, How pale I look! I should like, I think, to die of consumption, because then the women would all say, See that poor Byron! How interesting he looks in dying! Byron's tongue-in-cheek comment further emphasises the odd appeal consumption held in the public imagination. In her fascinating study, Illness as Metaphor, Susan Sontag argues that having consumption was also believed to lead to a higher sex drive. It exacerbated sexual desire, and was often fetishised as an aphrodisiac that would confer extraordinary powers of seduction. There was a vogue for the consumptive look that was often fetishised and coveted, and that persisted during the 19th century. Clark writes that the consumptive appearance entailed dramatically pale skin and ethereal thinness, with red cheeks and a feverish glow. This became the defining fashionable aesthetic of the time, with women powdering their faces, some even using chemicals such as arsenic to achieve a paler complexion. So it was believed that consumption enhanced a person's sexual prowess, increased their sex drive, and boosted their beauty. And this belief was held so firmly by some that they actively sought out the consumptive aesthetic in ways we now know to be very dangerous. But there was another reason it was often considered a lover's disease. And that brings us to the next myth. Myth number three, that consumption could be exacerbated and even caused by feelings of romantic love. Hermione de Almeida, Professor Emerita of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Tulsa, writes about the essential confusion made by the European medical profession from the middle of the 18th century up through Keats's time between afflictions of the heart and diseases of the chest, between love and tubercular consumption. So as I've suggested, there was a pervasive belief in a causal link between creative passion and susceptibility to consumption. The same can be said of romantic passion. 
A lot of contemporary medical discourse suggested consumption was caused by a debilitating passion or a diseased nervous energy. Not only were sufferers highly sensitive to stimuli that caused the mind to overwork and give way to a detrimental overflow of creative genius, they were also left vulnerable to the overwhelming stimulus that is romance. There was also a belief that consumption might be cured if feelings of love were satisfied, but if a consumptive patient failed to win their sweetheart's affections, the consequences could be deadly. In 1820, Keats journeyed to Rome in a misguided attempt at curing his own consumption with warmer weather, and he was forced to leave his girlfriend, Fanny Braun, behind. As Professor Nicholas Rowe of the University of St Andrews writes, again and again, Keats returns obsessively to his frustrations as poet and lover to explain why his body is destroying itself. And Keats himself reflected that, I should have had her while I was in health, and I would have remained well. So, to overcome a disease that fed on errant passions, consumptive patients, as well as suffering through misguided cures such as bloodletting and starvation diets, were often required to keep as calm as possible. As Lawler explains, there was a popular belief that if one were overstimulated in any way, whether mentally or physically, then the body worked too hard and entered a state of intense activity that led to a depletion and potentially total exhaustion of this vital energy even resulting in death. Keats' friend Charles Brown, who cared for him during his consumption before he travelled to Rome, wrote to a mutual friend, If you come, do not let him hear your voice, as the slightest circumstance tending to create surprise or any other emotion must be avoided. But let's say bloodletting and chill hasn't worked for you, and you're in the final stages of consumption. What do you do? Well, you might take comfort in our next myth. Myth number four. Consumption resulted in a good and easy death. As Hammond writes, in the public imagination, it was often the case that consumption's more violent symptoms were set aside to favour depictions of a slow, wasting ailment that softly bore people to their graves. This was, of course, far, far from accurate, and the true nature of a consumptive death was often learned the hard way. According to Dr Thomas Beddoes, writing in the late 18th century, the idealistic perception of the disease was so ingrained in popular culture that when people actually experienced the reality of a consumptive death, they were completely shocked. Writers of romance, Beddoes writes, exhibit the slow decline of a consumptive as a state on which the fancy may agreeably repose, and in which not much more misery is felt than is expressed by a blossom, nipped by untimely frosts. Those who only see the sufferers in passing are misled by the representation. And I have heard many persons, thus prepossessed, after closely attending a sick friend, declare their surprise not less than their horror at the unexpected scenes of varied and protracted misery which they have been condemned to witness. But let's say you understand the true horrors of what the disease does to the body from first-hand experience. How do you stay calm if you then start coughing up blood? Well, you might choose to turn to religion and find solace in our final myth. Myth number five that consumption resulted in an ideal Christian death. At this point, you might be wondering how consumption was considered both a super sexy seductive disease and a disease that aligned with Christian morality. Sontag explains this contradiction. Like all really successful metaphors, the metaphor of TB was rich enough to provide for two contradictory applications. It described the death of someone thought to be too good to be sexual. It was also a way of describing sexual feelings. It was both a way of describing sensuality and promoting the claims of passion, and a way of describing repression and advertising claims of sublimation, the disease including both a numbness of spirit and a suffusion of higher feelings. We can infer from this that the stereotypes of consumption that fed into the public imagination were so powerful and numerous that they ended up contradicting one another without cancelling each other out. Sinners and saints alike were destined for the consumptive chopping block. But back to consumption and Christianity. The idea that consumption resulted in an ideal Christian death had to do with the length of time a patient typically had between contracting the disease and actually dying. Consumption wasn't a disease you'd die from overnight. As I've already touched on, it would often plague the sufferer for months or even years before finally taking their life. But this wasn't necessarily considered a bad thing. The slow onset of the disease was often considered a benefit. It gave the sufferer time enough to get their affairs in order, make amends for past mistakes, and prepare for death. It was a chance for redemption. And because consumption didn't typically affect the mental faculties, the sufferer would often retain their sanity till the very end. 
As Lawler writes, it was believed that dying from consumption could facilitate an ideal death in which the soul could be in a fit state to ascend to God's judgment, while family and friends could be dealt with in an orderly will. The death itself could be similarly controlled with appropriately edifying speeches to those gathered around the bed and a dignified departure to the next life. An orderly, controlled end, followed by a peaceful ascent to heaven. So there you have it. The disease of lovers, of passionate and sensitive poetic geniuses, of beauty, youth, desire, of sexuality, seduction, and saints. But how did these myths become so potent as to mask the dark reality of the consumptive death? The answer lies, in part, in the 18th century literature of sensibility, particularly in the popularity of the sentimental novel and the cultural beliefs and ideas that arose as a result. Characters in these novels would often be represented as acutely sensitive, with an ability to feel things deeply. This was often a sign of their goodness, but you might also find them swooning, weeping and sighing, often overcome by powerful feelings, and exhibiting problematic physical symptoms as a result. And one of these problematic physical symptoms was consumption. As well as the romantic disease, Lawler refers to consumption as the disease of sensibility. He explains how idealising the disease as good and easy was a common trope in sentimental literature, and an especially prominent feature in sentimental narratives that contained, or even culminated in, a Christian deathbed scene. Sentimental novels exploited the connection between preparedness, clarity and piety and the consumptive death to prove a character's goodness in their final moments, and there arose a vogue for aestheticised consumptive deathbed scenes in the literature of the period. A notable example of this can be found in Samuel Richardson's landmark epistolary novel, that's a novel formed of letters, Clarissa, published in 1748. The novel's heroine, Clarissa Harlow, is the pinnacle of sensibility. She feels deeply, and she dies what we might see as a good Christian death. What's especially interesting is that Clarissa's consumptive symptoms, as presented through the novel, are largely emotional or behavioural. Instead of having Clarissa spitting up buckets of blood, Richardson's representation of consumption is so symptomless, Lawler writes, that a specific medical term is not used because it would divert attention away from the emotional and spiritual focus of Clarissa's death. It's never definitively stated, therefore, that she dies from consumption, but the complex culture of the disease is everywhere in her deathbed scene. That Clarissa's consumptive death is so consumptive without Richardson ever clearly telling us that she dies from consumption shows the force and prevalence the disease had in the public imagination well before Keats's time. Lawler argues the representational flexibility and metaphorical power of consumption allows it to play a pivotal role in Richardson's novel, a novel which went on to be hugely successful and inspire successive literary interpretations of a good and easy death well into the Romantic period and beyond. As Lawler writes, mythologies of illness arise partly because humans must explain disease through patterns of language. We have no other choice in the matter. Put simply, people's need to explain, contain and even manipulate illness results in evolving discourses that may eventually detach themselves from what might be termed biomedical reality. I'd like to finish by drawing attention to one of the lasting consequences of the literary manipulation of consumption, and that's the persistent allure of the consumptive death in popular culture today, although we wouldn't necessarily recognise it as such. We're still familiar with and invested in cultural clichés that glamorise the early deaths of beautiful, creative individuals who seem to burn brightly and then burn out. We don't have to look any further than the star-crossed members of the 27 Club to begin to see how an untimely death carries a uniquely romantic cultural significance. In their book, Deaths of the Poets, Paul Farley and Michael Simmons Roberts reflect on the pervasive stereotype that to be a true poet means to push your life to the very brink of ruin and death and ultimately beyond. There is no escaping the fact that, in many cases, a dramatic, tragic, youthful death reframes a creative work and gives it an allure that isn't really available if the artist died peacefully in bed aged 90. We can see the parallels between these contemporary cultural clichés and the consumptive deaths of brilliant, doomed creatives like Keats, and in many ways we still fetishise, glamorise and hold a torch to the consumptive death and its strange romantic interpretations today. A death that signifies a person's passion, genius and goodness, and a death that comes all too soon. Now I think it would be remiss of me to end this video without mentioning coronavirus. I think there are some fascinating parallels between Covid and consumption, not only in the nature of the diseases, the fact that they're both respiratory, but in the uncertainty they both present and have presented, uh, particularly with Covid at the start of the pandemic when we didn't know what was going on with the vaccines and we were in the dark, much like people in Keats's day dealing with consumption. 
And I think it's also going to be really interesting to see how we imagine and reimagine and remember COVID in the years to come. I think it's going to be very fascinating to see how that pans out. Lastly, I want to plug this book, Illness as Metaphor by Susan Sontag. Now, a lot of the books that I've quoted from today are fascinating and well worth a read if you get a chance, but a lot of them are academic texts, which are often very pricey. This is not an academic text in that sense, um, so it's the price of a normal book. It's very short, it's accessible, um, and in it she compares tuberculosis with cancer and the way that we have traditionally imagined both of those diseases in our sort of collective imaginations. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, this is well worth a read. So I hope I've started to unpick how and why consumption was characterised by these myths in the Romantic period. And I hope that by showing something of the fascinating disparity between the grisly reality of pulmonary tuberculosis and the way it was conceptualised in the public eye, I've suggested just how powerful our collective imagination can be. And with that, I'll see you in the next video.